Very good. We are two minutes past the hour. Um, my name is Joaquin Espinosa. I work for people with Down syndrome in a few different capacities. One of my roles is to serve as the leader of the administrative and outreach core of the Include Data Coordinating Center, or DCC for short, which is the agency that is hosting this webinar today. So this is the fall 2024 webinar by the Include Data Coordinating Center. We have a, a great agenda, if I may say so. And uh, um, first today, we're gonna hear from Dr. Hui Chai Lin, who is the um, project scientist from the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, who is co-managing the Include Data Coordinating Center. Hui Chai, the podium is yours. Thank you, Joaquin. Let me pull up my slides. Um, share my slides. Okay, let me present mode. Can you see my slides well? Yeah, we can hear you and see you very well. Thank you, Joaquin. Perfect. Thank you, Joaquin. Um, thank you, Joaquin, for the nice introduction. And um, welcome, everyone, to the Include the Data Coding Center for Webinar. Um, I want to welcome you all and uh, also want to share with you some major updates from the INCLUDE project. This is a very fresh slide about Down syndrome funding at NIH. And uh, you are the first group to see this uh, updated report, actually. By the end of uh, fiscal year 24, NIH has invested more than 438 million over the past seven years on um, over 350 awards through the INCLUDE project. Please go to the INCLUDE website for all INCLUDE funding opportunities. And I want to remind you that all the RFAs with multiple uh, receipt date will be renewed, which includes um, the R03 NOFO, um, for data curation, data sharing, and data analysis that uh, this group may be um, specifically interested. So this is the QR code for our funding opportunities on the INCO website. Um, this is a summary of the major numbers from the INCO product. As I mentioned earlier, over 350 products, um, including 15, clinical trials funded under 50 funding opportunities with more than 450 publications so far, 22 NIHIC collaborators and 13 NIH, uh, sorry, 13 include hosted community engagement and outreach events. And currently there are more than 7,800 individuals with Down syndrome represented in the data hub. You may have seen this slide um, many times, but I just want to refresh your memory that there are three components under the INCLUDE project. Component one is on high risk, high reward basic science studies. Component two is on cohort studies. And component three is on clinical trials. Current activities under component two include both DS Connect Registry and the Include Data Coding Center effort. Another major effort under Component 2 was launched at the end of last month, which is the Include Cohort Development Program, the Down Syndrome Cohort Development Program, DS CDP. And the goals um, of this program are to improve our understanding of the natural history of Down Syndrome to better determine the frequency and the variability of co-working conditions, and to enhance our understanding of heterogeneity in Down syndrome, and to examine the impact of dem demographic, social, experimental, and environmental factors on outcomes. And then it will also to expand our understanding of current used therapeutics across the lifespan and cultivate data critical to the initiation of drug trials. 
um, you can see this is a major initiative uh, under INCLUDE. And I will take more than five minutes today because of this program. Uh, hopefully you are interested. I'm very excited about this program. And the, the major project um, activities of the CDP include the following. First, development of common protocol of a common protocol that covers comprehensive deep phenotyping and bio sample acquisition. Second, um, collection of demographic, clinical, laboratory, biospecimen, and imaging data from people with Down syndrome to enable discovery and the validation of new biological targets. Third, outreach and recruitment to create an inclusive Down syndrome re um, program, a Down syndrome research program. This one, this uh, slide is showing an overview of the program. The Down, uh, the Down syndrome clinical research sites will enroll a diverse Down syndrome population and collect the identified demographics and the clinical metadata together with bio specimens um, that will be deposited to the uh, DS bio repository where samples um, of, for omic studies will be extracted and delivered to sequencing centers for sequencing. And then the data will be shared through the include data hub. The demographics and uh, clinical metadata will be ingested to the DS um, clinical cohort coordinating center, so-called DS4C for curation and harmonization, and then will be delivered to the DCC to share with the uh, research community or the general uh, research community. This is the list of the points of coordination on the NIH team. Um, you can reach out, for, um, feel free to reach out um, my colleagues if you have any questions regarding to the CDP. And I will be acting the product scientist for the DS4C until new personnel is hired to take this role. Um, this slide is um, showing the domestic geographic location and PI information for the clinical research size, the bio repository, and the DS4C. The next slide is showing the international site locations for the Latin America network and uh, the DSCDP is the largest, as I mentioned, the largest investment made by INCLUDE. And we believe it will not only increase participation in clinical research, but also diversify our study population. So next, um, I will share with you a few reminders that could be helpful for your research. First, um, as you may know that the INCLUDE Data Hub is a data portal but I also want to remind you that it's also a data repository. We highly recommend you to list um, the Include Data Hub as, uh, as the data repository in your data management and sharing plan for all Include applications. The DCC website has instructions and templates um, for the DS DMSP, and here's the QR, QR code for your reference. In addition, the Include Data Hub is a cloud computing platform. And I want to um, remind you our cloud credit pilot program. Please scan the QR code for more information. To help address any questions you may have um, regarding to the, um, the Data Hub for Data Portal or uh, Kavatika. The DCC has office hours on every second Wednesday at 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern. Last but not the least, if you are planning to go to ASHG, the American Society for Human Genetics conference, annual conference in Denver this year, please join the joint NCDRA event co-hosted by the Gabriel Miller Kids First Pro uh, the Data Resource Center and uh, the Include Data Coordinating Center. Finally, I want to thank um, all the Include leadership team and thank you for your time. Thanks. 
Well, King, go back to you. Thank you, Hoi Ching. And, you know, I should have said this earlier, um, that our attendees are free to enter questions in the chat. Uh, I'd be happy to serve as the moderator uh, for today. So if there are any questions for Dr. Lee about any of this wonderful news that she shared with us, please um, enter in the chat. We can also, you know, if something comes to you, enter in the chat, we can tackle the questions at a later time during the webinar. So I believe that uh, next in the roster is Dr. Robert Caro. Robert serves as the leader of the Data Management Core, one of the three cores of the Include Data Coordinating Center. And today he will be sharing uh, with us about the journey of an included study. Robert, the podium is yours. Thank you, Joaquin. Uh, and I'm here presenting on behalf of a large team um, involved in the Data Management Core. I think there are probably even some few names that, that didn't make the slide today. Um, and so it's really exciting to be a part of this team and, and serving the Include Research community. Uh, if you were at the Include Investigators meeting, some of these things will look very familiar, but we've got some really great updates for you about the work we've accomplished so far in 2024. So at a high level reminder, we our goal really is fundamentally support the Include researcher community and the broader Down syndrome community uh, by doing a couple of these things, providing reusable and interoperable standards and software, iterating with um, you all, the data users and contributors, and acknowledging that shared responsibility for data preferred transfer, and then really help build out tools that support transparent monitoring and tracking. Uh, and, and these are things that we're continuing to develop on. I think these are sort of new goals. I, I stepped up to be the lead of the DMC earlier this year. And so we're really excited to continue to support uh, the community and, and see how we can grow. At the high level, this is the process that's been in place in, in the, um, the Include Data Coordinating Center for the last four years. Starting off with Joaquin's group and the AOC, engaging with researchers, working with them to collect data through our data intake teams, bringing that data in, into the include DCC systems, annotating that information with metadata, standardizing and harmonizing the data that were provided, um, exchanging that data via FHIR, bringing that data into the include data hub and, and portal, and then finally enabling, ana enabling analysis in Cavatica for researchers. So uh, it's, it's a long process, and I think some of you have experienced how long it takes once, once you've shared your data to when we've actually been able to make it available in the portal. And so this is the process that's been going right now. Um, and I think we, with this, we've been very successful in the past. I think we present a great product here. Um, and if you don't think that, happy to hear feedback. Please please share that with us about gaps or ways you'd like us to expand. But we have this, this portal, this data exploration page, for example, that allows you to drill in and understand elements that were captured across uh, many include studies. And so we're excited to make this product available. Uh, it does take extensive work and it takes time. And so we've been working on a couple of things to help speed that up. So we'll get to that in a minute. But really, there's there's these five updates that we have to talk about today. Uh, the first is the release of this V5 harmonized data set that happened in August. And so this is a, an expansion of data that I'll drive into. Uh, we have the Include Data Repository service was launched also in August and some more study pages and data sets with, in August. Um, and Additionally, we'll be working towards DOIs, which we'll describe, and then the NDA GUIDs, um, which we can talk about soon as well. So this is, a, this is a screen cap of the portal from earlier in 2024. You see we have information about 11 studies, 9,000 participants, um, and I think it was, it was, it was a good showing. Um, and I'm excited that today, um, even just yesterday, we actually pushed an update that added additional studies. You see the, the portal looks different. Um, I'll leave that for my colleagues to talk about later, but you see we have a lot more studies represented. Um, 19 up from 11 in the, in the prior slide. And so we've we've done a couple of refinements to make that possible, uh, which I'll dive into. One of the big pieces is the release of a new harmonized data set. So uh, again, across our tenure so far, we've released five different versions of harmonized data. Again, that's where we've taken the data, annotated it, aligned it to the same standards and released it in a consistent way so that it's uh, trying to really meet that cross-study use cases for everyone. I mean, we included two additional studies, um, and thanks again to these teams for working with us to help get the data out. We're excited to have have these these full studies, these participant-level data harmonized. 
Um, one thing we also did, um, and this is a group by folks like Purette Lowe and um, some of the TIS lab, updating the model to represent, better represent the data and capture some additional features. So it's been it's been great to be able to extend, extend the study meta metadata that's available. And we're entering into a phase where we're gonna be able to more rapidly produce study pages. So when if you're an include funded study, come reach out to us early. We'd be really excited. We can get your information up as soon as you're ready into the portal. We don't have to have data yet, you know, just about the investigators, just about the study you're performing. We're actually able to do that now and support that. So we're really excited to have that. Um, additionally, this release included some additional participant data from other studies that we'd already incorporated. So it's two new studies, refreshed from a few studies, including some new um, sequencing data, um, all supported by Kavatica DERS. We initially have release notes that are available, and you see that snapshot on the right. If you're interested to learn the detailed what we added, I encourage you to check that out. And I'll share, after I'm done, I'll share my link to these slides so you can catch those links. Um, that's in the include uh, hub, data hub support pages. The second thing I wanted to talk about is the Include Data Repository service that was launched also in August. And this is part of what's enabling the work we're doing. So the Kavatica team has been hard at work deploying that secure DIRS server for Include. And so this it works with the NHLBI's uh, security boundary that uh, Dr. Lee mentioned earlier and provides an opportunity for these, especially the large files, but even, even the small files to be made available securely. Uh, we're really excited about this. This is empowering us to release more data to everyone. In, in the past, we were somewhat limited in what data we could share because of those access control restrictions. But with this fully featured um, implementation of this data repository server, we're actually able to share that. Um, there's some great features for cloud platforms that really enable that efficient, effective exchange of data, but also it supports the, the local download. So um, there's, it's a really exciting feature that we've added just, just this summer. Additionally, we I mentioned this a little bit before, we extended our model, um, the team was hard at work at that, and then launching some additional study and data set metadata. So if you go into the portal today, uh, this is a small snapshot, you'll see there's this idea of a data set. Um, we're, we're bringing this on board. This is something that we've launched the first phase of in August, and will be um, that question there at the bottom, how do I download that data? That's coming, coming very soon, and I'll talk about it in a minute. But Actually, we're actually able now to talk about those things in data sets. And that's, I think, a great thing. This will help us streamline that process to get your data out. Right. And the goal here with these data sets is to say, hey, this work that we're doing for the metadata annotation and data standardization is really important and enables a really cool user experience. But that's not all the data fits in that model. We don't, we don't, you know, it takes a time. We're using some expert annotators to do a lot of work to standardize it, but um, also just no, not anything fits. So, how do we help? get you straight from like, hey, we're submitting our data to very quickly, other people can, you can analyze that data in, in the hub or in Kavatica and other people can analyze it too. So that's that's really that goal. We want to bridge this. And this is this is what I was proposing earlier in the year that we're working on. And we're we're getting really close. Um, this example from the human trisome project page, this is, this is live today. You see that same idea. You see updated study metadata um, up in the top, but then you also see there's a set of these um, harmonized or harmonized and unharmonized, but uh, data sets at the bottom. And so we, we, it's nice. We get to see some additional information about what's there. And again, this is something that we're doing in collaboration with the submitter. So thanks for all, all the hard work from each of you. We're able to make that available very soon. Um, with the new Kavatica Durst instance, we'll be able to close that loop. We'll actually be able to collect this metadata, which we've been doing. We'll be able to put that out there. And now re research users can access that data. Those original study files that you submitted as they were, we'll be ready to push it out. So that's, I think it's a very exciting. It's coming very soon. We'd hope to get it to you today, but it'll be, we're expecting in, in, the, in the coming month or so that we'll be able to have this feature for the first set of data sets. And then we'll continue to be rolling that out again in collaboration with each of you data submitters. Um, this, this is the mock-up here, but you'll be able to just go to that same page, this DS Connect data that came through. You can now, down, you will be able to download that, um, analyze it in Kavatica or, or work with it locally. And so we're really excited to offer that. I know it's something that's been um, in, in high demand. So that'll be coming very soon and we'll be sure to let all of you know when we when they add this new feature. And that we'll, we'll roll that over time. You know, we need to go back and make sure each of those files are ready, that we have the right data dictionaries, that everything looks good to share. So um, it'll take some time before every study piece of study data is out there, but we're excited to be able to make that available. Uh, and the fourth item that I wanted to talk about was is something that's in progress. We're, we're just getting started on this, but in collaboration with the NIH and NHWI and Datasite, we'll actually be able to support DOI soon. Uh, this is another really important feature that I know investigators have asked. When you publish, you want to be able to 
put that, put those DOIs that, hey, this is where my data is. This is where you can download it. Studies often even require DOIs for publishing, um, or journals do. So I think this is going to be really important. Uh, we'll be working out the details soon. We've done some preliminary work. We're in early de uh, development on this feature, but we can expect in the coming months that you'll be able to request when you submit your data to have a DOI minted. Uh, we'll manage that process with Datasite, who's a, an independent group that works with NIH and others to mint those DOIs. And then you'll be able to link that directly to your study pages and data sets within the hub. And so I think I'm hopeful that will be a great tool. Again, as, as we continue to develop, we'll get this ready and then and we'll launch it again, hopefully soon. But in the in the coming months, I believe we'll be able to launch this feature to support. So I'm, I'm really excited to see that. And again, that's all, it's all about sort of closing that loop, helping make studies and data sets of your research data available, accessible to other researchers um, as effectively as possible. Uh, so, you know, as we're closing out 2024, we're going to continue to work with all of you to gather those new and refreshed study data. Again, I really appreciate everyone who's taken the time to work with, with folks like Haley and Peretz that are gathering this refresh information to make sure it's up to date, that we're capturing all the right fields so we can make your data available. We really appreciate that hard work. We're going to continue to do that, and we're going to continue to develop these new features. Um, so I'm really excited. You might have noticed that I skipped number five um, on my list of terms, and I'm going to hand that over back to Dr. Espinoza to hit to hit the the QIs, which again, really excited about. So if you have any questions, um, happy to happy to take a look and talk Thank to you, me. Robert. Um, a lot of exciting developments, and Dr. Mary Allen, and include from the investigator here in my neighborhood is asking whether you can define what do we be, mean by model when we say data model? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the uh, one of the things that we've been doing is is harmonizing the data. So we get when you when you submit your data, you create you maybe had a spreadsheet that you created, you captured that important information through Redcap, and you handed it to that. It doesn't look the same as an another investigator would would have submitted. Maybe because you're collecting different types of data. And so this model that we're describing is, is what we're kind of aligning everything to look like that. And so when you go to the hub, it very much reflects like, hey, participants have this idea of conditions, right? And so you can say, oh, great, I know about that. And, and maybe you called it something different than a different investigator, but anytime we're trying to express, oh, this person has a phenotypic feature of interest or has a comorbid condition, we're able to kind of align that. And I, I'll drop a link in here with, with the documentation if you want to take a look into the technical details as well. That's a good question. Thank you. And Robert, I uh, share here in the chat the GitHub entry for the Lincoln Mail model and as well as a, and a screenshot with a very brief summary uh, of the Lincoln Mail data model. But but if there's other documentation that you want to share, please do so. Yeah, here. no, I think those are great links. And I think I'll, I'll drop, yeah, yeah, that's exactly the links I would share. And so again, there, it's highly technical documentation, but it does dive into the details of, of what we're doing on the inside. And this is part of the challenge. And this is where you can imagine um, aligning everything into these common sets that takes time. Um, that, again, the annotations, some of those, those terminologies that are being used, we wanna make sure we get concepts. And that, that's what drives some of the really cool features in the UI. So you can say, hey, who has heart conditions? And, and it can do that, do that computation for you. Very good. Um, in the sake of time, we're gonna transition and I'll, um go next to talk about another cool development, uh, which is the GUI strategy for the um, Include Data Hub. And um, very good. Robert, can you see my slide? Can you hear my spine? That looks great. Loud and clear, very good. So yes, uh, we've been very excited to, to arrive to this point where we can share with you uh, the strategy for linkage across the include ecosystem. So as Robert highlighted, we are we have a high class problem right now. And we have a lot of studies. We have a problem of abundance, you know, 19 studies already they have and many more coming up, leading to a total of 9,421 participants for which uh, for whom we have some kind of data. Now the the question is whether these participants are unique or not. How many of them may be, if you will, duplicate participants? Uh, and this is a, a real life scenario. I want to illustrate this with a flesh and bones example. This is 
Dr. Marisa Stoll, a dear colleague of mine who is interested in celiac disease in Down syndrome. Celiac disease is 10 times more common in this population. And she's interested in studying genetic variants that may predispose to the appearance of genetic uh, of celiac disease. So she comes to the hub, say, and sets up a filter for females with trisomy 21 and celiac disease. And she sees that multiple studies have participants that may match that criteria. And some of those studies may have genomics or transcriptomics. So the question that comes to mind right away is, well, how many of the 95 in DS Connect uh, may be also represented in the HTP or in ABCDS? So, because it is totally possible that some individuals contribute data to multiple studies. So how big is the problem slash opportunity? The answer is we don't know. And this may vary greatly depending on which studies you are comparing. But in the one case where we were actually able to answer the question, it was more than 10%. More than 10% of participants in the Human Trison Project are also participants in the DS Connect registry. Again, this may vary greatly. You know, if you have studies where one study is inclusion criteria is infants and you have ABCDS, which inclusion criteria is only all the adults, of course, the overlap may be minimal. But if you have other studies, oftentimes the studies um, involving the same institutions over and over again, you may have a lot of overlap. So the question that we're trying to solve here is how many so-called dual citizens are out there? Now, this is a problem, but if, you, if your glass is half full, this is an opportunity because this means that the same participant may be providing different data types, data sets through different studies. So this participant may come to study one, provide a whole genome sequencing and some clinical data, then may show up in a study two that had a different emphasis on nutrition surveys. Same participant may show up in yet another study where they contributed to transcriptome and imaging, right? Now, in every study, uh, the D identifier may be different, right? You may one, two, three, four, five, BA seven, A one, and what have you. Of course, the studies wouldn't be sharing personal identifying information. So, how do we solve this issue? How do we uh, create opportunity rather than a problem? Long story short, the NDA GUIDs. So, the Office of Data Science at Sherry at the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development, did a comprehensive analysis of a number of strategies here, and they landed on the NDA GUID. NDA stands for National Institutes of Mental Health Data Archive, NDA. And GUID stands for Global Unique Identifiers. This is one of many possible approaches out there. What is it? Well, it's a, a tool, an algorithm, if you will, that takes six fields of personal identifiable information, the first name, middle name, last name, sex, date of birth, and city and country birth, to create an alphanumerical code known as the NDA GUI. So now we can go from a scenario where the, there's no linkage across the studies, right? Here the participant is enrolling in multiple studies over time contributing to different data sets. Yet, it is not possible to merge those data sets because each study has been using their own unique alphanumerical code. Now, if we use, if all three studies had used the NDA GUID, we would know there would be a mechanism to realize that it's the same participant, it's the same person that has been showing up at all these studies. So that creates a unique opportunity to link data sets across the studies. So how does this work? Well, there's a YouTube video here that explains it much better than I'll, that I'll be able to, and we can put this in the chat as well. Uh, but this is basically the summary. If you are a member of a study team that wants to use the GUIDs, you Logging into what is called a GUID client in your own computer. So you can download a client of this algorithm, of this, of this tool from NIMH. And then on your computer, 
you feed this personally identified information, those six fields that I mentioned earlier, which then sends one way hashes to a GUID server administered by the National Institute of Mental Health. And then if those hashes match the characteristics, the demographics characteristics of an existing participant, you'll get the same GUID that was given to another study. If this is the first time that the GUID server sees this combination, this hashtag, um, then you get a new GUID, okay? So then you end up getting uh, the GUID. No personally identified information is sent to an, an IMH, right? This, this is happening. The, the, the PI never leaves your computer, right? You get that alphanumerical number, which is the GUID identifier. Again, if, if it was a known subject, you will get an existing GUID. If it is a new subject, you will get a new GUID. Right? So once you have a GUID, now we're going to step number five. You can come to the Data Hub or some other repository and provide your data with a GUID. Right? You're telling us this is the participant, this GUID, rather than one, two, three, four, five, you use the NDA GUID. So now all the researchers in the community are able to access that data where participant, participants have been assigned an NIEMH GUID. And if enough studies use the NDA GUID, so then uh, we'll have an opportunity for linkage, right? So some important considerations, these GUIDs will be treated as controlled access data. Let's pretend it's a whole genome sequence. That's what we mean, right? It's a sensitive piece of data that won't be shared publicly. We will not be displaying the GUIDs in the include data hub. Instead, access to these GUIDs will be authorized through a DBGAP study. DBGAP is the database of genotypes and phenotypes. Oops, it's a typo there. Um, now, to make things easier, we'll have all include GUIDs into a single study. And once you're authorized through that study, you will be able to access what is called the GUID mapping file. So in a single file, you will have all the studies that have GUIDs and all the list of GUIDs and the list of study IDs assigned in the data hub. And that's how, by comparing GUIDs and study IDs, you'll be able to merge data sets across the studies and we'll have a more real life demonstration of this uh, in the next talk. So if you go now um, to the data hub, and this is a brand new feature, you will see that some studies have a G there. That means that they have GUIDs, like DS Connect and the Human Trison Project. If you wanted to access those GUIDs, you would have to click here, NDA GUIDs for Down syndrome research. And if you do that, you will be prompted, step number one, to request access to the GUID mapping file. So this, you have to go to dbgap and fill in the proper forms and justify why, why you want access. Once you've been clear, then uh, you'll be able to then copy your GUI mapping file to your Kavatika project, okay? And then we'll, we'll hear later about how this actually uh, works. So that means that the include CC will not, at this point in time, link data sets across the studies. That's something that the, you, the data hub users, will have to do on your own to identify those dual citizens, right? Users, again, will need to gain access to the DVGAP study with the GUIDs mapping file to be able to create that merge data set. Now, it's all good and dandy, but the only way this, this works is if uh, multiple studies, ideally all the studies, side into this concept of generating NDA GUIDs. You know, NIH is not mandating this, but we are all encouraging it as a, as a very good solution uh, to be able to link participants across studies. So without broad adoption by us, all of us, the data generators, the issue will remain. We won't be able to know um, who the dual citizens are. The more GUIDs, the merrier. This also brings uh, the need, brings up the need to start talking about our research participants about this, right? Uh, hopefully, include funded studies are consenting properly for broad data sharing with the data hub and other data repositories. But now I think we need to add language to our consent 
But it's not just about data sharing, but there is also a possibility that the data will be linked. And here in bold, this is an example provided by uh, the include leadership. Here in bold, I'm highlighting the key aspect. Right? We need to explain to research participants and the families that it's possible that if the participant is in more than one study, researchers may be able to combine the identified data to ease the burden on researchers and participants alike. Right? The purpose of sharing this information is to make more research possible for the benefit of everybody with Down syndrome. So everything that I just said, and then some, is available to you in our documentation website and include thecc.org. You want the docs, global unique identifiers, and you will land it here. And there's basically an explanation of the slide that I just presented. And then if you never use the NDA GUID, we'll put together a how-to guide, which is also linked there. And you can go and step-by-step -step understand how um, to download a client, how to enter the PII, how to get a good. And that's my um, brief presentation today. And we'll be hopefully also uh, posting this presentation, this video um, in our help center as well. Any questions about this? Otherwise we should transition to the last presentation from the DCC before um, we go into our scientific presentations for the day. Any questions or comments about the GUI strategy? If not, then uh, I'll pass the podium to my colleague, Adam Resnick, who serves as the leader of the Data Portal Core. Adam, the podium Thanks is yours. Thanks so much, Joaquin. Um, so for my portion of the next few minutes, I'll uh, briefly touch base on um, what Robert uh, and Joaquin highlighted as related to this uh, emerging concept of unharmonized studies, just to provide a little bit more views for you on how those look and feel within the portal. And then I'll take the, the this GUID use case one more step further uh, and define you know, one version of a workflow um, that really taps into that use case that um, uh, Joaquin described. And then I'll highlight a few more features um, that we've just launched as part of the portal um, in partnership with the St. Justine team uh, there. So I just wanted to make sure that you know there's a shared mental model, a uh, different kind of model uh, than earlier for everybody on how um, these unharmonized studies look within the studies uh, portion. And again, I just want to call out that they will all be essentially annotated with this U as a context. And, and key is that these are going to be dynamically changing uh, across time. Um, we'll begin to have an unharmonized study uh, page as soon as possible. And then that information will get updated. And ultimately, a portion of, of many of these studies will become harmonized studies as a context. Um, and this is one of the ways that you'll be able to essentially view that context directly within the portal. Um, and so we have multiple different views within that initial study listing, but also when you click into the study, you'll have key signals as to whether or not the study is yet harmonized, unharmonized, and how to interact with that data moving forward. Let me go into the GUID uh, piece, because this is really, I think, uh, highlights a couple of different points that Joaquin and, uh, had highlighted. One, you know, within the INCLUDE program, we're going to expect that participants are going to be participating in multiple studies, particularly across a lifespan. Um, so it's not unreasonable um, to expect that there will be multi-dual or multiple citizenship, as um, Joaquin mentioned. But one use case that uh, Joaquin already mentioned is just simply deduplicating understanding numbers and cohorts. A second, um, as uh, Joaquin highlighted, is really being able to link different data types. But the third, and this is something that um, intersects with both of those, uh, is something that we see very often, which is that even at the same data modality, so for example, the phenotype of a participant, um, that may not always be constant, right? So it may be the case that um, at one portion of a study or an initial enrollment, 
um, one phenotype was annotated, but maybe the condition didn't really become annotated or precipitate until the participant was older. So even within one context, meaning um, a certain condition or co-occurring condition, not all co-occurring conditions are co-occurring within a participant all at once. And that creates another layer of complexity into this context, but also, as uh, Joaquin mentioned, an opportunity. And I'll just walk through that use case um, with a few slides, and then we'll be developing additional videos and workflows around this for you guys to uh, follow up. So if we take that use case of a condition and we want to ask the question, how many more participants potentially um, within the HTP project have hearing impairments than I might have realized? Meaning asking the questions that, you know, as the HTP uh, project has annotated a set of phenotypes, maybe uh, the DS Connect annotated at some later time or a different time that a participant might have a um, hearing impairment, and it, but I want to augment that cohort within the HTP with those DS Connect participants and their phenotypes so that I can assess a new cohort or a meta cohort for potential um, biological variables uh, in that context. So I can go to the portal and I can start asking this kind of question by saying, okay, let me choose all the HTP participants, um, the DS Connect participants, as a context, and then I can add a phenotype in this context. So here I'm just adding, you know, hearing abnormality uh, via the um, HPO browser. Um, and you can see the numbers for each one of these contexts, and then I can combine them just to get a sense between them, right? So there are 193 participants that are in HTP that have hearing abnormality annotated, and then there are gonna be another 1,346 participants um, when I combine the DS Connect and phenotype. And the question is, are there more than 193 within HTP um, that I can then attach these molecular files to them and expand my cohort with a particular phenotype, right? So this is just another iteration of augmenting cohorts through this context. And the reason this really works is because, you know, the HTP has, you know, really well molecularly characterized cohorts Whereas the DS Connect cohort by and large has phenotypic cohorts um, uh, in that context. Again, something you can assess within the studies page. I wanted to pause and just um, re remind um, you, know, you and others that you know, the platform within the Data Hub really functions between this registered context where you can explore and create cohorts. And as Joaquin mentioned, a controlled access environment that can support the ingestion and analytics around controlled uh, access tier um, data. And again, the GUID file itself is a controlled access tier context. So let's go through uh, the views that would happen if you actually wanted to operationalize asking this kind of question, leveraging the tools and environments within uh, the data hub. Okin mentioned you would come here and you would essentially request uh, the GUID mapping file. And it, this will triage you and guide you through the dbgap process. Uh, if you went to dbgap right now, you would see that there's one requester um, for the, the GUIDs. And again, we practice what we preach and try to go through these processes. And so uh, you can see that I, uh, as Adam Resnick, have access to the GUIDs um, within dbgap. And then that means I can operationalize and work on those GUIDs within the context of Kabatica. So when you click on copy the GUID mapping file, you'll get a prompt as to where do you want this file to land within the Kavatica workspace. And I already have an include GUIN use case uh, project within Kavatica that if I choose that, it'll end up uh, in that context. So within Kavatica, um, you'll end up coming to an environment that is, you know, the include GUID use case. And within this project, um, you'll have your include GUID mapping file. So this file essentially provides you the mapping, but if you want to do more with it, you can add additional files and context you know, to that file. And just for the purposes of demonstration, what I did here is I brought in the phenotypes from both HTP and DS Connect um, as paired with their subject IDs. That way I can use the good mapping file to link and assess augmentation of the cohort between them. And you can actually download the good mapping file and operate on that file locally, but you can also leverage the Kavatica environment to iterate on that workflow. 
this is what the GUID file looks like. Now I've replaced the actual goods here with just dummy IDs, but it's really just three columns, right? That provides you a study code, participant ID from um, the portal, and then the good itself. And this then be becomes the link where I can ask this question, let me bring me all the hearing impaired um, participants within um, HTTP, all the hearing impaired participants within DS Connect, bring them together and assess if there's a Venn diagram of overlap. Um, and then, there's a Venn diagram of overlap between participants and or Venn diagram of overlap within phenotypes. And what ends up happening typically is that there is a Venn diagram of overlap between participants, 10%, as Joaquin mentioned, participants will overlap. But then it turns out that they're within that 10% of participants, there are participants that within HTP are not yet annotated as having hearing impairment. And I can attach that HPO term to those participants, and suddenly my cohort of hearing impaired participants within HTP grows, and I can then do more with it. You can do this with a number of different environments within Kavatica. I chose to do it within an RStudio environment uh, within the Kavatica. So I just essentially launched a data studio uh, context here, and there's not enough time to go through the entire process live. But um, this process allows you to essentially bring those files uh, process them in that context and really begin to see that augmentation of features between the two cohort. Leveraging the fact that we have harmonized HPO terminologies and Mondo terms between these two studies, I can see how I can potentially augment any one feature within one study and then take that additional cohort here circled in the box and add it to the HTP cohort in ways that can, I can then bring back into the um, portal environment. So once I have my new participant set of more than 194 participants as augmented by DS Connect, I can bring that back into the, into the portal environment and iterate within the HTTP project and attaching new files and augmenting that cohort. For me, this is one of the ways that we can really even immediately begin to harness goods um, within the context of include, right? So, you know, to remind sort of a, just this triaging of use cases, right? One is just to assess, you know, overlap or duplication of participant. The second is really to assess how you can augment one participant with data collected in one study with data collected in another study. The third, which I just highlighted is how to augment participant cohorts by leveraging even the same data modalities, but generated or collected at different times. This is especially, be especially applicable across the occurring conditions and phenotypes because include is going to be longitudinal because different teams are collecting that data uh, in this context. So you can begin to leverage and build and expand cohorts within a particular study that's generated uh, data within that context. Let me finish with uh, just a couple more really exciting features. You know, I always worry about presenting a lot, a large amount of code, right, on, on a webinar. And I just showed you an R Studio, right, with a bunch of code that I wrote to process this data. And we recognize that this is both a gap and opportunity, you know, for us to improve in that context. The Include Data Hub already has, you know, an environment for you to start filtering and exploring variants. Um, and we just began piloting additional views and analy anal analytics that you can begin exploring within. Uh, the portal itself. So you don't have to begin leveraging RStudio or um, Jupyter environment. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that for those of you who are doing that. So one of our first pilots really uh, is to empower uh, not only querying variants, but ex querying expression analysis by gene um, and participant in this context to begin leveraging work that's already been done by investigators like uh, Joaquim himself here. So you can go today to the portal and click on that analytics button and you'll see the capacity to explore the Kano plot that allows you to essentially see their gene specific or participant specific positioning and differences uh, between um, cohorts that are trisomy versus disomy uh, context. So for example, in this context, you can choose a particular gene and see the total difference um, and the effect of karyotype 
on a particular gene expression value between these two cohorts as a context. And I think this is a very facile framework to again, allow users to explore that data moving forward. So we're moving not just from allowing expression of variants, but now looking at continuous variables like expression as one of those kind of components within the portal. And we'll continue to iterate on these types of exploratory features within the portal. And you have an option to sign up for additional views. And uh, these are some of the next steps we'll take as uh, we move forward, where you can begin to search across multiple patients, multiple uh, genes uh, in that context. And then how do we uh, lower the barrier for taking those cohorts and operating on them within the controlled access environment of Kabatica? One uh, last feature that I'll note, it's one of my favorites, um, which is, you know, as I highlighted earlier, a lot of the way that we uh, leverage the uh, cohort building activity within the portal uh, harnesses this what's termed as faceted search, right? On the left-hand side, you can click and explore different features of either participants, samples, or data and files. Um, and that's a really powerful framework, but oftentimes users don't know where to start. Uh, which facet do I click on? Where do I start my search? And so we've added this quick filter um, feature within the portal. So you can just start typing within that environment and you'll immediately be triaged to the correct facet um, in ways that you can explore. So give that a try and give us feedback on that context as you begin to explore uh, the portal. And with that, I'll end my uh, 10 minutes and look forward to additional feedback. Um, as Joaquin and Robert mentioned, these are a lot of very new features. I think some of these are as new as yesterday. Um, so please provide feedback. We're gonna continue to iterate and explore this um, as we move forward together. Very good. Thank you, Adam. Um... Very powerful features, you know, uh, the GUIDs, Importa Analytics. You'll be hearing more about the DOIs and DOI minting. Um, we're really excited about that prospect as well. Any any questions? For, we have a, a few minutes to ask any questions to any of the presenters of the first hour. So this first hour was the DCC presenting. We're going to switch at the top of the hour to presentation from Include Funded Investigators. Any questions for Hoi Chin, Robert, myself, or Adam? I wanted to thank you, Mary, just briefly for the comment. I wanted to make sure that the workflow was clear. It sounds like you got it exactly what, what uh, we were going for. That's, that's exactly right. I just want to say thank you. This is going to really enable a lot. <laughs> Well, if there are no more questions or comments, we can uh, you know accelerate the time a, a little bit here. I'm sorry, Brian, if if some people were signing up only to listen to you uh, at the top of the hour, they'll be punished because you will start earlier. They, they, they will miss the first five minutes of your presentation. So without further ado, you know, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brian Hales so, um, from the Kansas University um, Medical Center, KUNC. We'll be presenting today uh, on the topic of sit less, move more. Are you, are you saying that to me, Brian? I definitely need to sit less, move more. Exploring physical activity as a strategy against Alzheimer's disease in adults with Down syndrome. Brian, the podium is yours. Uh, thank you, Joaquin. Uh, yeah, I think all of us could uh, receive that message. I know I've been sitting a lot today, so that's uh, it's a good reminder. Um, can you see my screen okay and hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. All right. So as Joaquin mentioned, I'm gonna uh, talk about sit less, move more, exploring physical activity as a strategy against Alzheimer's disease in adults with Down syndrome. Uh, so hopefully you relate to the topic a little bit, but if not, uh, because this was a uh, data focused uh, presentation, I did um, put together this presentation in Cordo, which is a technical publishing system. Um, so everything that you see here is all written within uh, our studio. Um, so just uh, if you don't relate to the presentation, maybe we can talk after. Um, I definitely love uh, exploring how data can be visualized and reported um, in very nice formats. 
So to give you a little bit of background, many of us already know this already, but Down syndrome is the most common chromosomal condition in the United States. Uh, it affects about one in 700 newborns uh, each year. Um, over the past uh, 70 years or so, we've seen the prevalence of individuals with Down syndrome increase from uh, 50,000 to about 270,000. This number, the, this citation was back in 2017. So that number is likely higher uh, now. I think I've seen some estimates uh, of over 400,000 and maybe there's uh, even higher ones out there than that. Um, so the graph on the right just kind of demonstrates the uh, longer life expectancy that we see in individuals with Down syndrome, which is uh, in large part why we see the prevalence numbers increasing. But we also see that the lifetime risk of dementia in this group um, exceeds 90%. So if you didn't know this already, Down syndrome is considered a genetically determined uh, form of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is due to the overproduction of amyloid beta from an extra copy of the amyloid beta precursor protein gene found on chromosome 21. And so this leads uh, to uh, Alzheimer's disease like neuropathology about 20 to 30 years earlier in individuals with Down syndrome. Um, and consequently, Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause of death in this population, um, with the average age of onset being about 54 years and the disease duration lasting about five. Uh, so this is, is a really nice figure uh, published by uh, Juan Fortea. Uh, it shows the kind of separation between amyloid beta, uh, tau, and neurofilament light, or NFL, uh, alongside declines in hippocampal volume, glucose metabolism, and cognitive function. That vertical line at around age 50, it represents the average age of onset, um, but we really see that separation start to occur in the late 30s and early 40s. And so this is kind of when we start to see some of the pathology uh, features of Alzheimer's disease um, with a lot of the clinical symptoms uh, maybe showing around that age 50. Although almost all adults with Down syndrome will display the neuropathology consistent with Alzheimer's disease uh, by about age 40, um, we're seeing that not all of them develop dementia. And this may be in part due to cognitive reserve. And so cognitive reserve, the best definition I could find of cognitive reserve is that it's the brain's ability to adapt and overcome limitations and cognitive function caused by aging, disease, or injury. Uh, so it's an active model of reserve, which suggests that the brain compensates for damage through um, the different recruitment of different neural networks um, or the use of like learned alternative cognitive strategies. Um, but really, cognitive reserve might be influenced by a complex interaction between genetics, environmental factors, and each person's ability to um, actively compensate for the pathological effects that we see with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so factors that might promote cognitive reserve include uh, a lot of our lifestyle factors. So physical activity, diet, sleep, mindfulness, uh, cognitive stimulation activities. Um, so like crossword puzzles, things like that, uh, as well as social engagement. Um, so I put a QR code on screen if you want to scan that. Um, I just thought this is a good overview. So it's a link to the University of Wisconsin's Dementia Matters podcast. Really good podcast if you haven't listened to it. Um, but they had a recent episode reviewing uh, six pillars of brain health where they outlined physical activity, diet, sleep, mindfulness, cognitive stimulating activities, and social engagement. Um, but for today's presentation, I'm going to focus in on that physical activity uh, pillar. And this includes both reducing sedentary time and increasing movement across all intensities. Uh, so let's start with research in the general population uh, because it does seem more abundant than the research in Down syndrome. Um, so just really quick, high level uh, physical activity. There are reviews that are showing that physical inactivity rather is associated with about 12% of Alzheimer's disease cases in the United States. Um, and this is estimated to lead to about 1.1 million cases or attributable cases of Alzheimer's disease per year. So 
it does have an influence um, in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, these are largely through um, several listed, but not necessarily exhaustive um, benefits to brain health. And so when we look at leisure time physical activity, which is like intentional exercise, recreational exercise, um, it's not job related work, um, but it's rather going out and uh, engaging in physical activity on your own, like taking a brisk walk. But this has been associated with increased brain volume for whole brain, your prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, or just a few of the studies that I found. Um, it's also associated with improvements in cerebral perfusion, neurogenesis, neurogenesis synaptogenesis as well, uh, and reduced amyloid beta accumulation and tau phosphorylation. And so while this research is largely based on adults without Down syndrome, uh, focus of today's presentation is trying to find out more about Down syndrome. So what do we know about these effects on those with Down syndrome? Um, so the research on physical activity and Alzheimer's disease in adults with Down syndrome is really limited. Um, so there are some studies that show that physical activity uh, is associated with cognitive function. But all the studies that I've found that look at cognitive function, um, either they don't look at imaging or they do look at imaging and aren't finding the associations with um, amyloid beta or tau in the imaging measures. A lot of it's cross-sectional data, so there is that limitation. Um, a lot of it is in younger samples. But really the challenge of overcoming the genetic predisposition to amyloid beta um, might be why we're not seeing some of these linkages between uh, maybe physical activity and uh, amyloid beta taken via PET imaging. Um, but we also have uh, several of the studies that have um, looked at this association also recognize that there's a lack of a Down syndrome specific physical activity measurement tool. Um, so what usually works for the general population, um, we know probably won't work for individuals with Down syndrome, different biomechanics, different physiology. A lot of the general population uh, measures of physical activity rely on either self-report, obviously limitations with that, but also um, device-based measures that have been calibrated for adults without Down syndrome. And so developing a Down syndrome specific physical activity measure has been one of my focuses since my postdoc uh, and now into my early career faculty position um, when we were working on a randomized controlled trial, uh, and it actually it was nice to see that that RCT is now highlighted uh, or was highlighted earlier on the, the data hub um, as the brain power study. But when we were going through that, we recognized that there wasn't a, uh, a measure of physical activity that was working in this population. And so that led to um, a couple grants uh, that I'll talk about today uh, where we tried to actually calibrate portable accelerometers uh, to improve the measurement of physical activity in adults with Down syndrome. So what we did for this grant, so this is one of my postdoctoral fellow training grants. Uh, so TL1 was the grant number um, from July 2021 to 2023. Uh, we had adults with Down syndrome come in and complete a stage walking protocol. So they started at 1.5 miles per hour we had seven minute stages and each stage we increased the miles per hour by 0 0.5, slowly kind of incrementing them up in exercise intensity while we we're measuring energy expenditure through an indirect calorimeter. And we had portable accelerometers on their non-dominant hip and both wrists, kind of trying to capture movement from three different locations. Uh, so we did have 25 adults with Down syndrome who participated in the study um, and uh, we also adjusted each person's activity energy expenditure by their resting measure. Um, and what this did was it kind of personalized that, that measure of exercise intensity. Because a lot of times we use what are referred to as metabolic equivalents. And you'll see that on screen uh, in the next couple of slides, uh, which is just your activity energy expenditure divided by your resting. Uh, and typically we use three METs to indicate moderate intensity. So for each treadmill stage, uh, we measured energy expenditure, which um, 
the indirect calorimeter and movement intensity with the portable accelerometers. And we did this across the seven minutes, but we allowed them the first three minutes to get up to their steady state. So really we kind of chopped off the first three minutes knowing that there would be some adjustments with the uh, energy expenditure data as they kind of ramped up to that speed. Um, you know, just like our heart rate, when we start walking, it takes a while for it to jump up to where it's going to kind of maintain that level if we maintain our speed. Um, so we uh, looked at the first uh, four minutes, uh, or, or sorry, the last four minutes of each of the exercise stages. Uh, and this is an example from one participant who completed six stages. And you can see kind of what the accelerometer uh, data looks like. Um, we smoothed it out a little bit here, um, but you can kind of see a nice proportional uh, intensity increase with the accelerometers as they as we ramp up that uh, treadmill speed. Um, we also saw proportional increases to the treadmill speed in uh, exercise intensity as measured by the indirect calorimeter. Um, so we so stage one was 1.5 miles per hour, stage six was uh, 4.0 miles per hour. And most of the participants, so we stopped this once they got to vigorous intensity. And most participants reached vigorous intensity at stage uh, three and or stage four. We did have about eight participants uh, reach vigorous intensity at stage five and only two made it to stage six. Um, but most of the, what, one thing that we were surprised about um, after doing this study was that we didn't necessarily expect um, individuals at the lowest treadmill speed to be over three METs, which we use for our moderate intensity cut point. Um, so previous studies in typically developed populations or individuals without Down syndrome uh, were starting the treadmill speed at three miles per hour following a similar stage protocol. Um, so we have to trying to make sure we captured uh, a light activity uh, so we could see when they actually crossed from light into moderate. And so with this, uh, this met value being above three, uh, we really had very few observations that were below um, a moderate intensity. And so this made this protocol maybe a little bit better for maybe determining a moderate to vigorous cut point, but not what we were after, which was light to moderate. And so you can see on the next slide here, uh, because we had so few observations that fell um, below moderate, especially at that stage one, the accelerometers didn't do a really good job at picking up um, the actual exercise intensity at that low stage. Uh, think about it as there's not a lot of movement in the wrists and the hip at those lower speeds, um, but we're still kind of putting out, um, you know, a decent amount of, of VO2 or ex exercise intensity measure. Um, so participants at that stage one were spending about 80% of their time in uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity based on our criterion measure, uh, but we were only capturing uh, about 20 to 30% of that. And so we needed a different protocol that offered a broader range of, of activity intensities. And so this led to my current career development award and what we're working on right now. And this is what I'm funded under the NIH Include project for. Uh, but we are calibrating accelerometers for physical activity using a little bit different protocol, similar measures. So we have a measure of exercise intensity. We have a measure of movement with the accelerometers worn on the non-dominant hip and both wrists. Um, but we are uh, doing a simulated free living protocol that includes uh, 17 activities spanning sedentary, household chore, and ambulatory and exercise activities. And you can see those activities listed there. And so far, we're about 65% complete with our recruitment. Um, so we're trying to get in about uh, 12 more individuals for this study before um, finishing it up and working on the manuscript. Uh, but you can see just from one of our participants that we do have kind of a broader range of, of intensities um, here. So we have some that are in that sedentary, so much lower in terms of their VO2. And then we're also with some of the exercises like um, stair climbing, we're getting into those moderate to vigorous ranges um, quite a bit more. And so 
uh, we're hoping that this data will then lead up to us to uh, be able to figure out a, a light to moderate intensity cut point, since moderate intensity is um, often what we see in the literature that's associated with a lot of um, health benefits. So in the meantime, we're also, um, even though we face challenges with accurately measuring physical activity in this population, we're also exploring some alternative methods as well. And so there was a recent consensus statement by uh, Miguelis and his colleagues um, for approaches for analyzing accelerometer determined physical activity measures uh, or physical behaviors in epidemiological studies. And so in their first table in their, their study, they described several accelerometer based metrics. Um, so time use behaviors, you can see that in the second row. Uh, that's often what we use. So those are estimates of um, like light and moderate and vigorous physical activity. Um, they could also be of different types, like walking, running, or cycling. And they could be bouted or unbouted, meaning bouted uh, is occurring together. So you often see like bouts of five minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity or 10 minutes. Uh, but they offer, also offer another uh, approach, which we're exploring now is um, the intensity spectrum. And the intensity spectrum is... Uh, an extension of cut points where we kind of expand and look at um, activity into different um, bins. And so it just, it, we, we kind of have these arbitrarily selected bins where we, we um, look at, you know, how much intensity is between zero and 50 and 50 and hundred and hundred and 150. And we use that as a measure of physical activity and look at how those might be associated with health outcomes. Um, they also proposed analyzing physical activity data as a um, compositional data set. Um, so compositional because uh, time use behaviors make up an entire day. So if you think of sleep, sedentary time, light activity, and moderate to vigorous, um, you have to be in one of those intensities throughout the day. So it makes sense that maybe we should consider this data to be uh, compositional. And they also, um, in this article, they talk a little bit about isotemporal substitution models. Um, and those models allow us to assess the theoretical effects of reallocating time from one of the time use behaviors, um, such as sleep, sedentary time, or light activity, to moderate to vigorous physical activity to see like what effect it would have on the health outcome. Um, and so this could be applied to our time use behaviors, like sedentary time, light activity, but it could also be applied to the intensity bands as well, or the intensity spectrum that I talked about earlier, offering a richer understanding of how activity patterns might relate to different health outcomes. And so we do, we have started exploring this with um, a lifestyle data set that can be linked to the Alzheimer's Biomarker Consortium for Down syndrome study. And we started with the um, intensity bands, but quickly kind of realized that um, uh, the Hildebrand cut points uh, actually worked well for both the TL1 data from the treadmill, but also um, was associated with some different cognitive outcomes in this data set as well. And so right now, um, we haven't published this yet, but we're working on the publication. Uh, but we looked at 87 adults with Down syndrome, average age 39 years. They wore accelerometers for seven days on their non-dominant wrist. Um, and we used uh, ENMO, or Euclidean norm minus one, which is um, basically the vector magnitude. So it looks at three axes from an accelerometer and subtracts uh, a thousand milligravitational units. And so just a little bit different metric. If you're familiar with actigraph counts, the, it's kind of similar to that, but it's taken from the raw acceleration data. Um, and so we applied different cut points to that. And we produced this um, compositional analysis plot here. So it's a ternary plot where you can see that uh, the average time spent in sleep was about 27% for the sample, inactivity was about 61%, and activity was 12.5%. And so we did regress this on uh, some different cognitive function measures um, where we looked at the modified Q recall test and the mental status exam that are taken as part of the Down syndrome um, ABCDS study. And when we did this, we ran a Tobit model for the modified Q recall test and a linear regression for the mental status exam. Um, we did this 
using uh, compositional analysis, which um, uses an a uh, isometric log ratio transformation in the model to account or handle multicollinearity. Uh, I won't go into details here, but i um, happy to talk more offline if, if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, but what this does to the model, or at least the coefficients of the model, is it makes it hard to interpret. So oftentimes in the literature, you'll see it paired with isotemporal substitution, which is the plot on the right. And so what this is doing, it's just saying, if we change the composition on the x-axis by either taking away or adding to the different intensities, what does that do to our, um, our queued recall test in this case? Um, so we can see on the moderate intensity one, if we start adding, so taking away proportionally from sleep inactivity and light intensity and adding to moderate intensity, we start to see kind of a positive increase that maybe plateaus, but we don't really have um, maybe a big enough data set to really see that. Um, but it does seem like the moderate intensity is uh, increasing the uh, queued recall test in this case. Um, so this is cross-sectional data. So there's obvious limitations with that, but um, it's just kind of a different way to, to look at it. So we are still very early in exploring physical activity as an, uh, a predictor of either cognitive function or um, changes in Alzheimer's disease like pathology for adults with Down syndrome. And so we have a lot of work to do. Um, our team here at the Medical Center at University of Kansas is uh, dedicated to advancing this research um, both in clinical trials and observational studies, but also in the measurement studies, which has been a large portion of my work. Um, the research, like I mentioned, is still early, and we're also developing additional research ideas um, and have our offerings here. Uh, so we do have some community resources for individuals with Down syndrome. Um, we do things like quarterly newsletters, and we have um, a remote-based uh, community exercise program for individuals with Down syndrome. Um, but we also have several different research opportunities that are growing, um, including uh, just becoming this past year a site for the ABCDS study. Um, and then we're kind of expanding into the caregiver group as well. There's an investigator here um, at the medical center that is looking at uh, doing focus groups with both caregivers and adults with Down syndrome um, to learn more about what programs that they're interested in, uh, as well as we're establishing or have established and are growing a community advisory board, which um, was recently instrumental in, in helping us uh, score a 1% on a recent grant application. Um, we're also exploring uh, digital health technologies and how we could use things like Exer games or, um, you know, behavior change strategies through like mobile phones uh, to change physical activity behaviors. Um, and other things that I'm interested in too are, are seeing if we can um, kind of access clinics and start to get clinic to community referrals where um, maybe we're aligning with a program like exercise medicine and get, getting opportunities for uh, doctors or other medical provider, providers to prescribe exercise um, while having trained staff uh, work with individuals with Down syndrome or other intellectual and developmental disabilities to um, treat their, their health problems with physical activity or exercise. Um, and so I'd love to talk to you a little bit more if you're interested in any of that. That's kind of a high level overview of the stuff we have going on at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, but I welcome any questions uh, as well as if you want to connect offline, uh, my email is on this slide. Very good. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, we do have time uh, for questions. Are you open to criticisms, Brian, as well? Yeah, absolutely. Very good. So we're open for questions and criticisms. So Brian, this, this contraption that you show there, you know, this young lady wearing some kind of backpack with a mask, you know, very futuristic. So you're asking your research participants to uh, wear that during the usual daily activities for 
a large, uh, long portion of the day. How, how does that work? Yeah, so it's not it's not a long portion of the day. We are having them come in and do what uh, a simulated free living protocol. So they come in and they wear it during uh, complete rest. So we should shut off the lights, you know, kind of ease them into it, get them familiar with the mask. Um, they're lying down for about 20 or 30 minutes while we're taking a resting measure. Um, but then we have them do these different activities, um, about six to eight minutes, each activity, they choose 12. Um, so we're trying to simulate like a little bit of choice or autonomy and, and making a uh, decision of what order that they're doing the activities in. Um, but we do progress. We, we, so we start with sedentary, we move to household chore. Uh, and then we go ambulatory and exercise, um, and but we let them choose what activities they want to do within those those categories. Um, so they're they're there for about two and a half to three hours, uh, but but not the entire day. Impressive. And uh, I will say the so one of the big differences with um, the TL one and the KO one. So we're using the Cosmed for the KO one. So this is like a backpack which allows them to do more kind of free living type activities um, for the TL one when they were doing the walking protocol, they were attached to a metabolic cart. And so it really kind of limited their, their movement. So this backpack's really been nice to allow them to have the same freedom of movement that they would have doing hustle chores uh, or, or even just regular exercise um, rather than kind of making them stay right next to the metabolic cart. It allows them to move around and, and to go at a pace that they want to. And, and so it's it's trying to really kind of simulate what they would do if they were at um, home. Very good. Questions or comments for Dr. Helsel? So Brian, are you collecting biospecimens? Um, you know, to match this physiognomics or whatever the, the right word is, this this amazing amount of data? Uh, no biospecimen data for this study, um, but a lot of our participants in this study have participated in other studies that have collected that, that data or some of that data. Um, so at least a few of our participants are ABCDS participants as well. Um, so they're and we're collecting all of that data. Um, some of them have participated in track DS or um, ran randomized trials. Uh, so Dr. Lauren Tomey has um, several randomized trials that either focus on diet or physical activity. Um, and a lot of those have measures of cognitive function or, or imaging measures or blood draws. Um, and so we're getting some of that data uh, from those studies that or at least it could be linked um, back to those studies um, though at least for some of them the the GUID is a little bit newer for us and so we're kind of exploring that right now can we start collecting that data or put amendments into like our, our IRB to collect the necessary information I think I think we have a lot of the information to to calculate the GUIDs but um, we might miss it, be missing like one or two of the key key pieces to to get that but that is something our team is exploring now very cool. Any questions or comments or criticisms for Dr. Hills? So, Gabriela Aguiarte, um, hi, Gabby. Thanks for coming. Paper of the aim, I think you mean to say, part of the aim would be to create a device specialized for recording activities for people with Down syndrome, something like a Garmin or a watch. Um, and this actually, uh, Gabby bit me to it because Brian, I, I, very selfishly, I would love to know what is your favorite wearable monitor. You know, I have both a, a Garmin and a Fitbit and, um, yeah. So, so is this part of your work? I mean, are you trying to, to come out with a, uh, best approach to, uh, wearables in Down syndrome, you know, and, and maybe be able to collect data a much larger scale yeah so the wear the wearables all exist i would say that i'm biased uh maybe toward garmin devices for the commercialized uh option um i have a garmin garmin's also located in the kansas city area and so we 
partner with them. Also, Fitbits have been uh, bought by Google recently. Um, so we we were using those for a lot of our studies, but noticed that it's uh, becoming a little bit more challenging to work uh, with Fitbit. And some of the devices that we were using, um, Fitbit devices have been discontinued uh, and Google is promoting their new watches uh, instead. So um, the API for Fitbit was really nice to work with. Um, I'm still becoming a little bit more familiar with the, the Garmin API, but um, in terms of what we use for our true measures of physical activity, um, they're act we often use ActGraph accelerometers. Um, so this is a device um, made by ActGraph. They have a few different models. One of their most recent models really, um, that they've really upped the technology on uh, what they are able to collect. Um, but at the main thing that we're interested in is a, a signal from the X, Y, and Z axis telling us which way uh, the participant is moving based on their acceleration. And then we turn those in through kind of post-processing. Um, I use R Python a lot to, to process the data off, off the X graph. Um, but we turn it into a physical activity me measurement. So we have the tool, but what we don't know is how to take the data collected from the tool, tool and turn it into a valid measure of physical activity for this population. Uh, and so that's a lot what my, my TL1 and, and KL1 is. So taking the data from the device, looking at how it correlates or it links to our true measure of exercise intensity, which is through the mass, the indirect calorimeter, uh, and then seeing if we can calibrate those devices um, after the data is collected uh, to get a, a valid measure of physical activity. Very good. Thank you, Brian. And, um... Last question for you, Brian, uh, before we run out of time here from Dr. Mary Allen. In general, the data implies exercise is quite challenging for individuals with Down syndrome, but several people don't fit that pattern. What can you say about those individuals that may not have um, this difficulty with exercise. Yeah, so are we, are we talking about the measurement specifically? Okay, so um, yeah, so accelerometers, often if you look at a validation study for an accelerometer, it's done in a small sample of people without disabilities or maybe college students, if that's what the professor has access to. Uh, and, and they take those cut points and they we try and apply them to a bunch of different populations. But in reality, uh, every population needs their own cut point. Um, they need their own maybe way to process the physical activity data. Um, there's some kind of newer uh, approaches where they look at like relative intensity. So like intensity relative or movement intensity, rather acceleration relative to the person. So they might have someone come in and do a walk test as fast as they can. And then that they set that as their maximal acceleration and look at, okay, how does their weekly activity compare to that maximal value? So it's kind of a more relative approach, but they're doing that in people with like chronic fatigue and, and other conditions. But yeah, each population really needs their own physical activity uh, measurement. So my interest uh, being in Down syndrome um, is kind of why I've focused there. Uh, and so a lot of what our studies are at the medical center, but um, really, if you study a, a different population outside of Down syndrome that has a, a physical or intellectual disability, or even you know if they have Alzheimer's disease or, or MCI, like there there hasn't really been cut points developed or, or measurement tools developed for those populations as well. Very good. Thank you, Brian. And we're at the bottom of the hour. Thank you very much for a great presentation. We're going to transition now to Dr. Adam De Smith from the University of Southern California. He will demonstrate the fascinating breadth of the INCLUDE project. We're gonna go from exercise and Alzheimer's disease all the way to epidemiology of transient leukemia in newborns with Down syndrome. Thank you, Adam, for joining today. The podium is yours. Thanks, Joaquin. Can you hear me okay? Very good. Thank Perfect. you. So yeah, thanks for inviting me to speak today. I'm excited to present some of the work from our sequencing study that's um, now in the INCLUDE DCC. Um, 
but also discuss in general how and why GATA1 mutations may develop in fetuses with trisomy 21. So first, just a little background about um, leukemia in kids with Down syndrome. So we know that children, children with Down syndrome have a high risk of developing acute leukemia uh, with up to 30-fold increased risk of a, uh, ALL, acute lymphobacic leukemia, and at least a 500-fold increased risk of a rare subtype of AML called acute megakaryoblastic leukemia. And it's estimated that up to 3% of children with Down syndrome will develop leukemia which is obviously much higher than the um, euploid population. And we know that trisomy 21 leads to perturbed hematopoiesis. And we see increased hematopoietic stem cells and megakaryocyte erythroid progenitors, impaired B cell differentiation, and likely that both of these contribute to the myeloid and lymphoid leukemias. And we know that newborns with Down syndrome can also present with what's called a transient leukemia, which is driven um, by somatic mutations in the GATA1 gene, which is a transcription factor essential for, for development of red blood cells. So around 10% of newborns with Down syndrome present with what's called transient abnormal myelopoiesis, or TAM. This is associated with uh, increased circulation of, of these immature megakaryoblast cells, um, it can be fatal in up to 20% of cases um, and uh, is driven by these somatic mutations in GATA1 that arise during pregnancy. So we also know that in addition to these, these diagnosed with TAM, there's about 15 to 20% of newborns with Down syndrome that have GATA1 mutations, but without the clinical features. And so these have been termed silent TAM. So for example, here, there are 169 um, individuals that did not have a GATA1 mutation from the previously standard techniques. And then through next generation sequencing, they found that um, about 20% uh, of these did in fact have a, a GATA1 mutation, but at a lower variant allele fraction than was able to be detected using the previous methods. Of these newborns with, with GATA1 mutations, uh, it typically resolves spontaneously, but up to 20% will develop myeloid leukemia in Down syndrome, or MLDS. So MLDS is a, is a two-step process then, where first we need the, the development of the GATA1 mutation, or GATA1S. Uh, it's termed that for the short isoform of GATA1. Um, so it requires, as I said, the, the development of GATA1 mutations causing this pre-leukemia, but to develop acute leukemia, you need these second hit mutations that occur during childhood, uh, typically uh, in, in uh, genes involved in the co cohesin complex. So I, I recommend this, this science paper, really um, uh, amazing work. One of the things they showed was how the GATA1 mutations affect hematopoiesis and leukemia development, and also identified some microRNAs on chromosome 21 that may be required for the persistence of these GATA1S blasts, so the, the clones containing these mutant cells, uh, sorry, mutant GATA1 gene. But some outstanding questions are, why, why do these GATA1 mutations develop in only some fetuses with trisomy 21? And why do they vary so much in clonal frequency? But first of all, before talking about our study, I, I wanted to go through some observations from the literature so uh, in 2006, it was actually shown that oxidative stress is higher in fetuses with Down syndrome than in um, normal fetuses or euploid fetuses, but also higher than in fetuses with, with growth restriction, really suggesting that, that Down syndrome leads to um, oxidative stress during pregnancy. Then uh, there was a study from Jeff Taub's group in 2009, where they looked at the mutational spectrum of GATA1 mutations and found that the a predominance of these particular uh, base pair changes that are consistent with uh, what we know uh, about the mutational effects of oxidative stress. And then a more recent paper looked at um, mutations occurring in, in fetal hematopoietic stem cells in, in trisomy 21 versus euploid, 
and found that those with a high mutation burden showed evidence of an oxidative stress induced uh, mutagenesis. So this is um, a mutational signature, SBS18, that's been implicated in uh, or associated with reactive oxygen species. So altogether, it's kind of suggesting this increased oxidative stress in Down syndrome. It's thought that that could be due to mitochondrial dysfunction or perhaps intrauterine hypoxia. And a study from uh, earlier this year published in Nature from um, a group at Stanford, they did single cell multiomics of, of human fetal blood in Down syndrome co compared to non-Down syndrome. And they found that, um, especially in these CD38, so these uh, committed stem cell progenitor cells, they saw significantly more um, mitochondrial reactive oxygen species in the trisomy 21 cells compared to the disomic cells. And they suggested this could be due to a higher mitochondrial mass and, dysfun or, and or dysfunction in the electron transport chain activity. In the same paper, they showed a skewing of uh, trisomy 21 hematopoietic stem cells towards the erythroid and megakaryocyte li lineage, suggesting more production of red blood cells. Um, and interestingly, at the GATA1 gene, they showed greater chromatin accessibility in trisomy 21 cells which would perhaps suggest uh, a greater likelihood of mutations forming when the chromatin is open. And uh, I almost forgot, but didn't forget to, to uh, highlight a paper from Dr. Espinoza and, and um, along with Matt Galbraith, where they showed uh, 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 across the lifetime, um, individuals with Down syndrome do appear to have um, increased hypoxia characterized by um, hyperactive interferon signaling. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that this study went as far back in the lifetime to include newborns, but still kind of supporting this idea of uh, increased hypoxia in individuals with Down syndrome. And some more liter literature here, uh, not from individuals with Down syndrome, but in ind individuals suffering from hypoxia, that's actually been shown that GATA1 is one of the most overexpressed genes in humans under hypoxic conditions. So this, this was here showing um, upregulation of GATA1 um, with uh, increasing uh, exposure to lower oxygen. And then in this study of, of chronic mountain sickness in humans, uh, they found, um, I think, over a tenfold overproduction of, of GATA1 in red here in individuals with, with CMS compared to um, individuals without chronic mountain sickness at the same altitude and in individuals at sea level. So all of this to me suggests a, a possible reason for the, the generation of GATA1 mutations is the overexpression of GATA1 in fetuses with Down syndrome, which, and we know that uh, upregulation of genes can increase the likelihood of mutations occurring. And perhaps, perhaps there may be some selection um, for this. Some observations for our, from our own work. Um, we previously conducted a study of DNA methylation in newborns with Down syndrome. And within this study, we, we conducted targeted sequencing of the GATA1 gene in most of the um, uh, newborn dry blood spot samples that we had. So we had 184 uh, both with methylation array and with uh, targeted sequencing. And we found about 16% had the GATA1 mutation. So first of all, we found that the um, in newborns with Down syndrome with the GATA1 mutation here in blue, they had significantly more nucleated red blood cells than individuals with Down syndrome without the GATA1 mutation. These data were deconvoluted from uh, the DNA methylation array. So they were not actually counts of, of these blood cells, but um, it does go along with what we know about um, transient leukemia and Down syndrome and increased blast production. We also we looked at whether there were any DNA methylation regions associated with the GATA1 mutation among newborns with Down syndrome. And we did find the strongest differentially methylated region was at this gene VTR VTRNA2-1 which is an imprinted gene um, and methylation has been associated with several environmental exposures or uh, pregnancy related factors, including maternal age, 
season of conception, maternal nutrition, um, and folic acid supplementation. And um, coming back to this idea of selection, we also found that among the newborns with GATA1 mutations, when we looked at whether these were functional or non-functional, -fun we found that the predicted functional mutations, um, the variant allele frequency, so basically how clonal they are, uh, the VAF was significantly higher on average in the functional for the functional mutations than uh, that of the non-functional mutations, which suggests possible selection of these functional GATA1 mutations. Uh, uh, that's a quite a bit of background, uh, which to sum up, we, we, we might say that we probably have an idea of why GATA1 mutations develop, but we haven't answered why, why do we see such variation across newborns with Down syndrome? So in our study, we wanted to investigate whether germline genetic variation may influence the development of somatic GATA1 mutations in Down syndrome. We did have a precedence for this. So we've previously published a, a genome-wide association study of, of ALL in Down syndrome. Uh, a little bit different, obviously that's an acute leukemia and, and we did know um, there were previously discovered uh, genetic variants associated with ALL in the non-Down syndrome population. And indeed we, we kind of rediscovered several of these. Um, so, you know, we were interested in, in the context of transient leukemia or GATA1 mutations might we see similarly strong effects on the development of these? So we were fortunate to uh, be funded through the INCLUDE uh, XO1 mechanism. And the original idea was to sequence 470 newborns with Down syndrome in the Oxford Down syndrome cohort study. So this was a collaboration with, with Dr. Irene Roberts and Parish Vias, who are uh, co invest uh, sorry, co-PIs of the ODCS, sorry, ODSCS. Um, so this would be the first genetic association study of somatic GATA1 mutations in Down syndrome. And we, you know, we proposed that the sequencing data could also be included in larger studies using XO1 data sets because we have information on congenital heart defects uh, as well as other birth defects and blood cell traits. And I'll come back to that uh, at the end of my talk. So the Oxford Down syndrome study, is, it's a prospective cohort study that enrolled infants with Down syndrome from 2006 to 2012 from hospitals across the UK. They followed participants uh, from birth to, to four years of age, collected phenotypic and clinical information, including on birth defects, whether TAM, transient abnormal myelopoiesis, was, was diagnosed clinically, and if any of the children went on to develop leukemia, ALL or MLDS. They conducted targeted sequencing of GATA1 at exons 2 and 3, where the vast majority of mutations occur um, on, on the ne neonatal blood samples. So our study is a genetic epidemiology study of transient leukemia in newborns with Down syndrome. So we wanted to perform a GWAS, um, as well as looking at the X chromosome, which harbors the GATA1 gene itself and also look at chromosome 21 variations separately, given that we know that trisomic genotypes, um, we want to apply different analytic methods to, to um, the disomic chromosomes. And we also were interested in genetic ancestry. In our final data set, we had 431 newborns with Down syndrome with about a 50-50 female to male ratio. Uh, we had self-reported race ethnicity information uh, and um, majority of participants were white, but we did have a, a range of other ethnicities. Um, and we had clinical information, uh, as I've mentioned. A amongst the 431 newborns, we have 105 cases that were GATA1 mutation positive and 326 um, controls who were wild type for the GATA1 gene. And only six out of uh, the GATA1 positive developed MLDS. This is just to show the variation in the in the GATA1 variant allele fraction across all the subjects. Um, and you can see, as expected, a higher VAF in the newborns with, with clinically diagnosed TAM versus those without TAM. And so we, we looked 
first at um, genetic ancestry in terms of uh, a principal components analysis and their relation to reference populations from the thousand genomes. Those are colored in gray in the background. And then you can see our individuals, different colors relating to their self-reported race ethnicity. So we could see that um, those reporting as black were clustering around um, uh, African ancestry individuals, whereas the self-reported white were clustering uh, along with European ancestry individuals. But this does highlight the variation in our study. And so we wanted to conduct both a multi-ancestry GUS as well as limiting to individuals of self-reported white uh, race ethnicity, given the potential for um, population stratification in our study, where we might see uh, false positive results due to differences in ancestry between the cases and controls. So what did we find? First, the, the multi-ancestry multi GUS, um, and this was treating the GATA1 mutations as a continuous variable using the variant allele fraction. We found a couple of uh, hits that reached genomite significance, but th for those of you that are familiar with looking at uh, GUS results, so this is what we would typically call a Manhattan plot where we have the negative log 10 p-value on the y-axis. So the higher the dots, the more significant the result. And then the chromosomes along the x-axis here. We would hope to see with significant results, a peak that looks like this with a kind of continuous um, range of, of, of variants. So each one of these dots is a, a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. Where we see hits that are genomic significance, but maybe not much else going on in between, this could be a false positive result, or it could be a low frequency variant where there isn't much in linkage disequilibrium. So altogether, not super exciting, but just uh, this peak looked more interesting, even though it didn't reach significance. Um, so you see there are several SNPs that are in high linkage dis disequilibrium or highly, highly correlated with each other. Um, not much is known about this gene. It's a, a small nuclear RNA pseudogene. Um, but as I said, probably the most convincing peak in terms of the number of nominally significant SNPs. And looking in the whites only, GUS, um, again, a similar story, not too much convincing here. Rather than a, a nice Manhattan plot, we would call this more of a kind of starry night where we see these individual spots here and there. And a similar story for uh, when treating GATA1 mutations as a binary trait, so yes, no. Again, um, here nothing actually reaches genome-wide significance, either in the multi-ancestry or in the whites-only GWAS. We were then interested in looking at the GATA1 region itself on chromosome X. So we performed what's called an XWAS, X and Y, sorry, chromosome XY association study. But here, that these results are focusing on the GATA1 region. Um, we didn't actually uh, show the GATA1 gene itself, but it's in the middle here somewhere. So on the left-hand side, this is the continuous trait. And on the right-hand side is the binary trait. And then we looked in males and females combined, males only, females only. And again, nothing, nothing significant after adjusting for multiple testing, um, as represented by this nice depressing gray color here. A uh, similar story for chromosome 21. Um, so as I mentioned, we wanted to analyze this separately. We actually uh, performed this for, uh, using the, the uh, GATK haplotype caller in triploid mode instead of in diploid mode. But I'd be interested to apply other methods that I know are being developed by um, uh, maybe some people on this call and others that are analyzing sequencing data in individuals with Down syndrome. Um, but again, across chromosome 21, and even when we looked at genes of interest, such as RUNCS1 or ERG, we didn't find any SNPs that were reaching significance after adjusting for multiple testing. So perhaps a little bit disheartening, but I actually think it suggests maybe less of a germline genetic effect and perhaps pointing to more, more of an environmental effect. And I'll, I'll come back to that point, but. We next looked at genetic ancestry, 
And so we we used something called RF mix, um, and we included reference populations from thousand genomes to call ancestry uh, across individuals. Um, and this is stratifying people into their self-reported race ethnicity. So you see that in whites, they're predominantly European ancestry. South Asians have predominantly South Asian ancestry. Blacks have predominantly African ancestry. And then we had uh, this others group, which includes individuals of mixed race and some uh, East Asian and Southeast Asian. Uh, but interestingly, when we looked at, um, we ran association tests for each ancestry group with the Gatawan uh, phenotype, we actually found significant association between South Asian ancestry and both the variant allele fra uh, fraction here. This was nominally significant uh, for the binary trait. But when we then subdivided South Asian ancestry into these uh, subpopulations, say, for example, ITU is the Indian Telugu group in the UK. There's the Bengali in Bangladesh, um, Punjabi in Lahore, Pakistan. And these all showed significant associations with, with GATA1, both for the VAF and for the binary trait. Uh, and so the, these perhaps could be proxies for genetic effects that we didn't have the power to discover in our small study, but they're perhaps just as likely to be a proxy for some unmeasured environmental effects that could correlate with um, ancestry. And this is uh, uh, data from, um, in collaboration with Dr. Irene Roberts, where we've looked at self-reported ethnicity, race ethnicity, as well as other variables that might be associated with, with the GATA1 uh, GATA1 mutations. So the only significant results we see across all of these variables, uh, and we looked at gestational age, birth weight, race ethnicity, intrauterine growth restriction, maternal diabetes, blood pressure, heart defects, and other birth defects. We see gestational age um, is, is negatively uh, associated with GATA1 mutations. And I think we know that, that more premature babies with Down syndrome are more likely to have transient leukemia. Uh, but among race ethnicity, we do see that South, South Asian ethnicity was associated with a twofold risk of GATA1 mutations um, and even remains when we adjust for all of all in a multivariable analysis, adjusting for all variables. Although I will note that maternal diabetes did show a nominally significant uh, association with an odds ratio of almost two, although it didn't reach statistical significance. So to summarize, our GWAS of transient leukemia did not identify any strong germline genetic risk factors for the development of somatic GATA1 uh, mutations. Perhaps the development of GATA1 mutations may largely be due to the effects, uh, combination of effects of trisomy 21, selective pressures, and perhaps bad luck, depending on um, whether the mutation that develops is functional and whether that causes the, the GATA1 clone to, to grow out. The association with South Asian ancestry suggests potential environmental factors that warrant further investigation. So I think one of the next steps would be potentially a, a, a cohort study where we could look at in a larger sample size uh, and um, look at several different uh, maternal exposures during pregnancy to investigate whether these might influence GATA1 mutation development. And also of interest, I think fetal hypoxia as a potential modifier of the generation of GATA1 mutations and or the expansion of mutant clones. And also with uh, larger studies with sequencing data becoming available, perhaps we can expand our GWAS um, and also look at other things such as structural variation. And just uh, wanted to highlight an example of how our data has been used in other studies. So we have a, a preprint along with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Leslie and Stephanie Sherman looking at a GWAS of, of congenital heart defects in Down syndrome using our data. So I just want to conclude and acknowledge my collaborators uh, especially at the um, the PIs of the Oxford cohort and my postdoc uh, Yun Si Lee, who has been leading the sequencing study that I presented today. And I'm happy to take any questions. And if anyone's interested in collaborating uh, with us, please let me know. Very good. Thank you, Adam. Great stuff. We do have time for questions. Adam, are you open to criticisms as well? Always. 
Is that okay? Okay, very good. Yeah. Questions and criticisms for Adam. You may have mentioned this, Adam, um, but you know, how do you think about the context of you know GATA one being on the in, on the X chromosome and the selection pressure that might be imparted in the context of somatic mutations? Um, you know, more specifically, you know, we see differences on the selection pressures that occur on these chromosomes, typically in cancer, um, from a germline perspective. If you're looking specifically at the germline mutations for GATA1 that might predispose for somatic mutations. Does that make sense what I'm asking? Um, in terms of the meaning selection of, of the somatic variants? Yeah, meaning that essentially, you know, processes of X chromosome inactivation or other contexts sort of eliminate typical selection pressures that you might occur in other chromosomal settings. So yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, I hadn't considered the those selective pressures of X inactivation too much, but could it then be possible that the selective pressure from trisomy twenty one is is kind of so strong that it's counteracting that? Yeah, I just wondering in that context. Yeah, you know, both for um, uh, so essentially, right, uh, the, the second hit hypothesis in other contexts might be different in the setting of sort of the X chromosome setting, um, you know, in, in, in patients in that context. But just a thought, just to consider as, as a difference potentially than what you might see in other chromosomal contexts. And I guess it is somewhat unique in that the GATA1, we don't see second hit mutations on GATA1 at leukemia diagnosis because they, they have the first hit Correct. um and that's the same mutation that you can find at birth right but they exactly. get these other mutations in in like cohesin genes etc that exactly. drive the progression to leukemia and so i think it's just a you know, an additional layer of an analysis or just thought that could be considered in that setting yeah no, it's, it's a great suggestion mary yeah, so um, you talked about how in Down syndrome um, pregnancies, there may be an increase in the reactive oxygen. Um, how variable is that from pregnancy to pregnancy? Meaning, yes, the population shifts, but if we were to measure individual women and whether or not they were having uh, shifts in oc reactive oxygen, would you see the GATA1 mutations in the individuals that are having the reactive oxygen species? Well, I think that's a study that needs to be done. Uh, I think we have we have no idea, right? Um, at at the moment, this is uh, pure hypothesis generating in terms of um, yeah, what's been shown. But the epidemiology hasn't been done yet in terms of, for example, monitoring pregnant women or interviewing women and then looking at GATA1 mutations. But I think it's. Yeah, the field is crying out for, for such a study. I guess, yeah. Then there's the ethical question of what well, what do you do if you find a GATA1 mutation, right? Because unless we there's a way of treating it um, and preventing leukemia. But, yeah. We are at the top of the hour. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, Brian, for two great presentations today supported by the INCLUDE project with studies and data sets that are in the INCLUDE data hub. So you guys are exemplary citizens of the community. Um, Hui Ching, any parting thoughts or comments before we wrap it up here? I mean, those are fantastic research. I'm uh, very curious, you know, if we are having the CDP and uh, will generate more data, give you more power. Adam, you will see a, result, a positive result soon, I guess. Very exciting. Hopefully, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good. We'll see you at ASSG, uh, if not at the spring webinar. Thank you, everybody. Have a good week and, uh, weekend. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone.